Mine today is Beyond Mindfulness, The Art of Giving a Shit About Things That Matter. I'm going to go one minute over. Sorry. Okay. Very quickly, I'd like to ask all of you to close your eyes. Keeping them closed, take a deep breath in, inhaling for seven full seconds, holding at the top for seven more, and then releasing for a full seven seconds. You can open your eyes. Great, thank you. I mostly did that to calm my nerves, but I appreciate you doing it with me. I'm kidding, but of course it does help because public speaking is scary and breathing deeply helps to calm and center you. We all know this already, right? You've been told to take deep breaths more than once in your life. I certainly have. And you've probably heard of mindfulness and can guess at some vague and ambiguous definition. Said simply, mindfulness is just moment-to-moment -moment awareness with focus on calmly acknowledging and accepting your own feelings. One of the most popular tactics for accessing this is, of course, deep breathing. Mindfulness has become a popular tactic both in the workplace and in our personal lives as we struggle to keep up with the fast pace of our modern world. The focus on being present, being in the moment, connected and grounded, to the world around us helps us slow our minds and process our stress. And all of this is important, but I think we should be aiming to go one step past that. I want to propose an additional definition of mindfulness that goes just one step further, because I think we can be just a little bit bigger and a little bit better than just focusing on ourselves. At the risk of getting too personal in a public speech, but in the spirit of vulnerability, this topic is of particular importance to me because for most of my life, I've struggled with crippling anxiety. In the aftermath of a personal crisis last week, I realized that what I was missing out on when I lost my connection to mindfulness, to the acceptance of the present moment, was also my connection to others. What I had lost, albeit temporarily, was my ability to care about other people. Other people's needs were less critical to me as I navigated my own personal storm. The new definition I propose is that mindfulness is actually the ability to think about thinking, to create an intentional awareness around your thoughts and your reactions to them so that you can consider others in a real and meaningful way. Or as I like to put it, mindfulness is the quality or state of giving a shit about the things and people that actually matter the value of mindfulness. In a 2005 commencement speech at Kenyon College in Ohio, author David Foster Wallace opened with the following story. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish as they're swimming, who nods at them and says, morning, boys, how's the water? The two young fish swim on for a while, and then one looks at the other and says, what the hell is water? The immediate point of the fish story is that the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. He goes on to talk about our natural, hardwired default settings and selfishness. There's no experience that you've had that you were not at the absolute center of, he says. The world as you experience it is right in front of you or behind you or to the left or right of you. Other people's thoughts have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, and real. The point of his speech was not to be didactic or to condemn selfishness, but rather to assert that the important work is to think about thinking, to become the master of our thoughts so that they do not become masters of us, to operate outside of that default setting. He claims that if we have the power of awareness and consciousness, then we can choose how we construct meaning. True freedom, he sums up, involves awareness and discipline and effort and being able to truly care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad little unsexy ways every single day. I propose that the true value of this new definition of mindfulness is that little piece in the middle, awareness and consciousness and the ability to think about thinking, to choose what to think about and where to invest your energy so that you can spend more time thinking about things and people that actually matter to you. But here's the thing. True mindfulness is highly intentional, and it does not come naturally, and it does not come easily. In her spoken word poem, I sing the body electric, especially when the power is out, 
Author Andrea Gibson asks the sun about the Big Bang and the sun replies, it hurts to become. I pick this quote because if true freedom is awareness and discipline and effort, then to become a truly conscious person, we have to do the hard and painful work of acknowledging and addressing our ego, the current state of mindfulness, and learning to operate outside of it, our new definition. As David Foster Wallace said, it's hard and it takes will and mental effort. And if you're like me, some days you won't be able to do it or you just flat out won't want to. So today I wanted to give you a few tactics to help you think about thinking, to get you started on your journey beyond mindfulness. The first is to spend less time in fight or flight. Mindfulness is not possible when our body is in survival mode and things like stress, caffeine, and our current political climate keep us constantly operating from our sympathetic nervous system, the system responsible for our unconscious responses. In this heightened state, our body tenses up, we become more alert, and functions not critical to survival shut down. Some ways that we can do this are yoga, meditation, acupuncture, deep breathing. Dr. Libby, a nutritional biochemist, author, and speaker said, the challenge is that we live in sympathetic nervous system dominance, and this can play havoc with weight management, food cravings, sleep quality, patience, mood, self-esteem, and overall quality of life. One of the hormones driving this is adrenaline, which communicates to every cell in the body that your life is in danger. Science suggests humans have been on the planet for between 100,000 and 150,000 years, and for the entirety of that history, that's what adrenaline has meant to the body. The nervous system doesn't know what the adrenaline amping you up that it's not from a physical threat to your life, but rather your body's response to the caffeine you drink and or your perception of pressure. The solution to this challenge, she asserts, is reconnecting with our breath. When we are able instead to activate our parasympathetic nervous system, the body slows, we stop making adrenaline, our muscles relax, and move into our body's rest and digest response. From this place, out of survival mode, when we feel safe, we can slow the mind, and consider our surroundings, calm the body to calm the mind. It's the drop down mask on an airplane philosophy. Take care of yourself so you can take care of others. And now that we're calm, the next step is to look inward and consider the four agreements. They are as follows. Be impeccable with your word. Don't gossip, lie, or speak unkindly. Don't take anything personally, literally anything good or bad. Don't make assumptions. Assumptions make an ass out of you and me, and you're probably wrong anyway. Always do your best. You won't always pull all of these off, but you can try, and that makes all the difference. These come directly from a book by Don Miguel Ruiz, a shamanic teacher and healer who uses his writing to turn complex human issues into common sense. And though they might seem like grandiose and abstract ideas, it's the awareness of them that helps to cultivate a new frame of reference and allows you to see through your lens of self in order to better consider, other, better consider others. Not only is Ruiz the cutest human alive, but also the author of one of my favorite quotes. The same way that you are the main character of your story, you are only a secondary character in everybody else's. Which leads me to my next and final tactic, accept 100% self-responsibility. When I was doing my training in Bali, this was the core tenet of the program and I struggled against it violently. It wasn't my fault I had a food allergy and I was sick all the time. It wasn't my fault my boss was an asshole. I refused to take responsibility for things outside of my control and because of that, I was a victim. It wasn't until I understood that life was happening for me and not to me that I was able to let go of this. It was a choice I had to make to not be a victim of my circumstances. By accepting responsibility and choosing to reframe I now realize that that terrible boss led me to red pepper and those terrible food allergies led me to health coaching and yoga and many other dramatic life changes for the better. This level of mindfulness is a journey and I have by absolutely no stretch of the imagination mastered any of it. But even simply being on this path has op opened me up to possibilities I could not have before imagined. It's helped me to be a better friend, a less reactive person, a more engaged employee, and a more thoughtful mind. I hope that what you get from this is another collection of dots, another possibility, another way of thinking that you can keep in your toolkit and access whenever you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or even open or thoughtful so that you can spend more time giving a shit about things that matter and less time on things that don't. And finally, I hope that this helps you go just one step beyond mindfulness 
one step beyond the present moment and helps you recognize, remember, and acknowledge that this is water, but that you can breathe, and this is happening for you. That's it. I did it! <laughs>